God's work there. If you have a Bible, please open to the book of Nehemiah with me this morning. Nehemiah chapter 9. When you read your Bible, there are some topics that, well, we'd rather, uh, would, would like to avoid if we could. And confessing personal sin to God is one of those topics. Yet we discover there are many benefits of confessing our sins. And the most important one is the restoring of our fellowship with God, the God who made us, the God who loves us. But there are also many other wonderful benefits that affect our mind, our body, and our soul. And so my message is entitled, Confession, Good for Your Soul and Body. Confession, good for your soul and body. Now, in Nehemiah chapter 8, the people of Israel, they, they turn to God. The temple has been built. The wall has been finished. God's people gathered together, and they heard the word of God for an entire morning. They had revival. They were sorry for their past sins. They celebrated that feast of tabernacles and booze. God wanted them to remember that he brought them out of Egypt with a mighty hand and then that they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years in those temporary dwellings. So the feast of booze, they're to do every year for an entire week to remind them what God did for them, how God took care of them. And so now they... They come together again. Would you please stand with me as I read from Nehemiah chapter 9? We'll begin in verse 1. And even what we're doing right now, standing for the reading of the Word of God, that comes from the book of Nehemiah, where they stood to hear God's Word. We follow that example. So follow with me here. Uh, Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 1. Now on the twenty and fourth day of this month, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting and and with sackcloth and earth upon them. And the seed of Israel separated themselves from all strangers and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. And they stood up in their place. They read in the book of the law of the Lord their God one fourth part of the day and another fourth part they confessed and worshiped the Lord their God. May we pray together. Father, we thank you for these people that turned to you with all of their hearts. And I pray that we will follow their example and that we also will turn to you with all of our hearts. We will worship you. We will confess our sin. We will find peace and power uh, from walking and fellowshipping with our God. I pray if there be one here or watching online and they're not yet saved, I ask for the Spirit of God to convict them, to draw them to yourself in salvation. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Do you know the Bible has a lot to say about confession? The phrase, confession, is good for the soul, is, is based on an old Scottish proverb. So let's take a look in the Bible and what does it mean? What is confession? Well, it means several things. It means, first of all, uh, it is an element of salvation. We know very well, Romans 10, 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be what? Be saved. Confessing Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, and that is confessing, saying it out loud. And trusting alone in his sacrificial death and resurrection. It brings salvation to our soul. Notice what Jesus said in Matthew 10. He said, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, to say it out loud before others, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father. Confessing Jesus as your Savior before others. Well, that's, that's an evidence that you are truly born again. Confession is an element of salvation. Confession of sin is also for Christians. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There on page two of your notes, we understand that when we confess our sins to God, we are admitting and agreeing with him, with God, that our actions, our words, our thoughts were wrong, and we desire to turn from that error. And so in a court of law, 
when a person confesses to a crime, they are agreeing that he or she broke that law. We all stand guilty in need of God's loving and gracious forgiveness. Proverbs 28, 13. He that covereth his sin, he that hides his sin shall not prosper. But whoso confesseth and forsaketh shall have mercy. Now, I I don't know about you, but I want mercy. I don't want what I deserve. I don't want what God justice calls for. I would like mercy from God. So so he says, you confess and you forsake. You know, a lot of us are good about that confessing part, but we're not so good about that forsaking part. That's what it says. You confess and you forsake and you have mercy. And so there's a confession of sin for Christians. Then there's the confession of personal offenses to others personal offenses to others confess your faults one to another pray for one another that ye may be healed james 5 16 jesus said if your brother trespass against thee go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone privately alone when Peter got up to preach on the day of Pentecost to thousands of people, he did not confess his sins and say, you know, on the night of Jesus' arrest, I denied him once, I denied him twice, I denied him three times. He's not confessing his sins to others because his sin wasn't against them. He, it was against Jesus. And so he and Jesus, they met privately. And so that's what the confession of sin of personal sins and defenses to other people. I must mention one other thing, and it's called positive confession. Positive confession is the name it and claim it teaching. It is a false teaching that believes if you say out loud what you want to happen, that God will make it a reality. Beware of the name it and claim it Preachers, a.k.a. Joel Osteen. So look it up at gotquestions.org. Is name it and claim it teaching biblical? And the answer is what? The answer is no, no. So that's what confession is. Now, what are the benefits of confession? What are the benefits of agreeing with God about our sin? Well, first of all, as I said, restored relationship with our Heavenly Father. That is number one, and that's most important, to be right with God, because as a Christian, you have confessed your sin. But notice there's more than that. Uh, What are the benefits of confession? The removal of guilt and shame from your heart and mind. If people would get saved, if people would practice the daily confession of sin... I believe that suicide rates would would plummet to all-time lows. People need the Lord, and they need to understand what the benefit is to their own heart when they follow God's teaching. It's the removal of guilt. It's the removal of shame. And you have, as Paul said, I've got a free conscience, a clear conscience before God and men. Notice also it's the reduction of stress and anxiety from our hearts. What most people need is peace, not pills. They need peace, not pills. The peace of God, the peace of God that passes all understanding. And you get that when you're walking with God, when your heart is right with God. Not that you're perfect. That's why we confess. We confess our sins. And then notice also, when you confess your sins, when you have made the mistake and you sinned against someone else, the reconciliation with someone that we have offended, or the forgiveness for someone who has offended us. Benefits of confession. Now, what, what did confession of sin look like in Nehemiah's day? Now, there's some things that are going to be a little bit different for us, but we can still learn from it. Four evidences of their sincerity. First one is in verse 1. In the 20 and fourth day of the month, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting. What is fasting? Fasting is a voluntary withholding of food to show great sincerity to God by setting it aside. 
In their day, it took, it took hours to prepare food. Uh, I mean, they didn't have Wegmans. They didn't have Giant. They didn't have Acme. They didn't have Renegers. Uh, uh, they didn't have restaurants. They didn't have uh, fast food places. And so they made everything from scratch. It took a lot of time to be able to prepare the food and then to be able to have the meal. And so when they're fasting, all of that time of preparation, all that time of eating, they give that to God. It's a time to pray to God, a time to confess their sin, a time to praise God, a time to, to worship God. And so it's a, it's a sacrifice. They're making a sacrifice. Now, you can give up other things, but in the Bible, fasting most often refers to the giving up of food. Most of us here today are fairly attached to eating, aren't we? Uh, most of us are fans of it. Uh, we need to eat to be healthy. We need to eat to keep up our energy. Eating makes us happy, especially desserts. And right now, some of you are, are getting distracted because you're beginning to think about lunch even more so than the first hour because we're getting closer to that lunchtime. Eating makes us happy. Fasting, in your notes, is an act of sacrifice. It's an act of sacrifice. Hey, hey, do you remember when, when David had numbered the people and God brought judgment and, and he let him choose the judgment? One was the plague and, and thousands of people died. And, and what happened is the death angel literally could be seen there in Jerusalem hovering in the sky over what we now know as the Temple Mount. It's where the Dome of the Rock is. And, and so David came to offer sacrifice to God. He came to a guy that was threshing the wheat there. His name was Aranua. And he said, I'd like to, to buy uh, your threshing floor and make sacrifice to God. And Aranua, what did he say? He said, you can have it. You can have it for free. I want this plague to be done too. And he said, you can take my animals, the oxen, and you can take the, uh, the wood from the threshing instruments and, and, and you can do the sacrifice. You know what David said? He gave a great truth there. David said this. He said, I cannot offer to God something that doesn't cost me anything. I've got to pay for it. This is my sacrifice to God. I, I, I'm glad you want to give it to me, but I've got to pay for it. I want, to, I want to sacrifice to God. It's got to cost me something. And that's what fasting is. It's a sacrifice. We are taking a year and joining together to fast on the first Wednesday of the month from sunup to sundown. It's voluntary. It's not a requirement. You don't have to do it. But if you want to join us on the first Wednesday of the month, September 7th is the next one because we say we care. We want to pray for our church. We want to pray for our community. We want to pray for our country. And we take that time, that extra time of prayer because we care. And so we fast and pray. That's what these people did. They were fasting. Notice also they were wearing sackcloth. We see that here in verse 1. They're wearing sackcloth. What is sackcloth? It's a very rough material made out of goat hair uncomfortable to wear can you imagine how that might have felt on their skin you know i, I i'm one of those people i don't like tags on the, on the back of my shirt that dig into my neck uh i, I get out the scissors rip it out uh, i mean if you make a hole in the shirt just rip it out or or pajamas or a shirt that you wear and uh, how can you sleep when that tag is just digging in you got to get it out imagine wearing sackcloth and it's all all over your whole body it's uncomfortable. And that's the point. That's the point. The whole purpose behind wearing sackcloth was to sacrifice the comfort of normal clothing and to remind you that you are in intense grief. You are in a time of stress. You're in a time of repentance. Why? They want to press into God. They want to get close to God. And they're turning to God with all of their heart. On page three, you see they had earth or dirt on their head. And we see that also in verse one. Uh, some of you have done that. You, you did that when you were in school on, on the playground, but usually you didn't put it on yourself. You usually put it on another kid. 
you were a bully and you remember it uh, putting dirt on other kids and uh, okay that's not what they did here they put it on themselves they put ashes on their head sometimes it's a sign it's a public sign of humility of repentance of sorrow of grief they're grieving in our culture how do we signify that we are grieving well well, it was common for years, many years, hundreds of years, for people to wear what color when they're grieving? To wear black. And for those that were here at Butch Clemens' funeral yesterday, all the, the grandchildren, they, they gave testimony, and, and you saw they were, wearing, they were wearing black. Different cultures do different things. This culture, they were, they were putting the, the dirt and ashes on their head. They're wearing sackcloth. Um, uh, we were in Vanuatu many years ago, and the culture there, uh, they, uh, in the South Pacific, they have a, a year of mourning. On the left side of the picture, you, you see missionary Jeremy Panero, uh, and uh, there's Pastor Gabby there on the right. I don't know the name of the pig out front, uh, but I, I, I know he was only there a short time. And so for a year... Uh, there is this this mourning the immediate family members mourn and you do you know how they mourn the way they mourn is is they don't cut their hair and they don't shave well the following summer my son jeremy uh he was there and at the end of that year they have they finish their mourning they cut their hair they shave their grieving is over. And so we were there in our mission trip when they were in that time of grieving. Jeremy, Jeremy, if you just raise your hand back there. Uh, he was there and took these pictures uh, when they did the ceremony. They cut the hair, they shaved, and mourning is done. One year of mourning, and, and, and it, was, it was completed. And then they celebrate. And our son, Jeremy, joined him with missionary Jeremy Pinero. And uh, as I said, he is there for the summer. And he helped capture and slaughter and prepare the feast. I've got a lot of pictures of those, but there's a lot of red in those pictures. And I thought it best not to show those pictures. And so they, they cook up the feast, and they have a great celebration. And they're thankful for that life. It was Pastor Gabby's dad who had died the previous year. And their mourning is over. One more thing we find here in Nehemiah. They began to pray and confess their sin. And we see that in verse 2. They separate from the strangers in the land. They stood, confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. You know, prayer can be challenging. Prayer can be hard work. Uh, I know most of us, we, we struggle to pray consistently, to pray diligently. It's so much easier to serve the Lord than it is to pray to the Lord. It's easier for many of us to serve the king than it is to talk, take time to talk to the king. And you note, you see that serving is an exercise of effort, but praying is an exercise of faith. When you take time to pray, you're, you're saying, I believe that God is there. I believe God's there. When you take time to pray, you're exercising faith. You're exercising faith that, that God is listening and hearing to your prayer. I mean, 8 billion people on the planet, and God is taking the time to listen to you pray. You're exercising faith. You're exercising faith that God is not only there, that He not only hears, but that He will respond and answer your prayer according to His perfect will. Because he is the loving Heavenly Father, and he loves his children. How many times have Christians asked, Do you think God will forgive me for the things I've done? The answer is yes, but you need to ask. You need to ask. 1 John 1, 9 promises he'll cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Never fall into the trap of the devil that somehow you have done something that God will not forgive. No, don't believe that. He cleanses us from all sin, every sin of our past. Now, there is a difference between confessing your sins before you are saved and after you are saved. You're still confessing sin. That part's the same. 
When you first come to Jesus and you ask the Lord to forgive your sins, what happens is you receive the Holy Spirit. He comes to live inside of your body. Your body's the temple of God. Your sin debt is paid in full. You are declared righteous in the sight of God. You're promised eternity in heaven. You confess your sin, you're saved. You're trusting in Christ. But after we are saved, confessing our sins is still very important. It's a a part of our walk with God. Does that mean I need to get saved again? The answer is no, no. When we came to Christ, all of our sins are forgiven, past, present, future. And and they're nailed to the cross. They are gone. They're gone. We sang yesterday at the funeral, Butch Clemens' funeral, my sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin, not in part, but the whole is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. Do you know there's a new false teaching going around that says Christians don't need to confess sin? Some guy writes a book, another guy reads it, puts it on a blog, and they begin to try and teach all these young preachers, you don't need to confess your sin. That's not in the Bible. They're reading a different Bible because that's not in our Bible. So there in your notes, as Christians, confessing of sins has to do with relationship. It's our relationship. Confessing my sin is what keeps my fellowship sweet with him. Sin still does what it always does. It separates, but it separates the intimacy of that relationship. Your iniquities have separated between you and your God. Your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear you, Isaiah 59, 2. Before we come to Christ, we're on the road that would keep us eternally separated from God. But after we come to Christ, sin, it just separates this fellowship. Yes, you're going to heaven. And yes, you're going to be miserable if you continue to sin. So how do you repair that relationship with God? You get alone with God and you confess your sins to him and you name it. Now, a clear example A clear example of this is in marriage. A clear example is in friendship with your friends. When I say something hurtful to my wife, when I do something that is hurtful and I wound her, I've sinned against her. Hey, hey, we're still married. We're still married. But something is broken. What's broken? The friendship, the intimacy, the relationship is broken. And when I feel guilty over that, that that leads me to be able to come to my wife and she was sitting in the front row during the first service. And I, 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 what I say is, honey, I'm sorry. I was 100% wrong. Will you please forgive me? And I name what I, what I, what I did wrong. And I ask her to forgive me. And then, and then she will say, yeah, maybe in two weeks, you know. <laughs> Maybe in two weeks. That is not what she says. All right? She's a spirit-filled lady. She loves God, and so she will say, uh, I will forgive you. What happens? Then the friendship and the relationship and the intimacy uh, is, is restored. Why? Because I ask for forgiveness. Now, we don't do this, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. When you do that, you're, you're still in control. What you say is, I was wrong. I'm sorry. Will you please forgive me for, and then you name the sin. And when you say, will you please forgive me, you're going from you being in charge to putting them in charge, and then it's up to them to be able to respond and to say, yes, I forgive you. Does that make sense? So how do you restore intimacy and fellowship in marriage and parenting, with friendships, with God? It's with confession. His desire is for us to confess our sins and he will cleanse us. This is God's truth. I've heard people say, I just just really feel distant from God. It's not his fault. There's a way to deal with that. Lord, I confess my sin. God is so ready. God is so anxious to hear the confession of his children to restore the fellowship and intimacy. It's so important. Verse 3, in verse 3. And they stood up in their place. They read in the book of the law of the Lord their God one-fourth part of the day 
And another fourth part, they confessed. And they worshiped the Lord their God. I, I, I'm telling you that for three hours, they read the Bible. For three hours, they confessed their sin. They worshiped God a fourth part of the day. Have you ever said, you know, I, I, I think I'm going to spend 15 minutes in prayer. And you start to pray. Maybe you're on your knees. Maybe you're, 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 in, you're in a favorite chair. And, and then after a little bit, you, you, you peek and take a look at the clock or you look at the watch and think, it's only been four minutes. I thought, I thought this was almost done. Uh, maybe you had that experience in exercise. You get on that exercise bike. You get on that treadmill. You start doing the workout. And you think, oh, I'm going to go 20 minutes. And, and when you peek at the clock, it's been three. Like, oh, why is this taking so long? It can be hard work, but it's, it's good work. Jesus said to Peter, James, and John in the Garden of Gethsemane, could you not watch and pray with me for how long? One hour. One hour. So notice the end of verse 4. Notice the end of verse 4. They said, stand up and bless the Lord your God forever and ever. Blessed be thy glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. God, thou, even thou art Lord alone that made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their hosts, the earth, and all things that are there in the seas, and all that is therein, and thou preservest them all, and the host of heaven worshipeth thee. They cry out with a loud voice, O God, O God, forgive me for my sin. O God, I praise you for being God. This is with all of their hearts. Notice he says, God made the heaven of heavens. What does that mean? Well, there in your notes, the Bible describes three tiers of heaven. And that first tier is the atmosphere. That's where the birds fly. That's where the planes fly. The second tier, uh, the heavens declare the glory of God. That's the sun, moon, and stars, and planets. But we're praying to the third heaven, the dwelling place of God. That's where the angels are. And all the host of heaven, they worship the Lord. Seraphims cry, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Paul talks about this in 2 Corinthians 12 too. He says, I was caught up to the third heavens. We're praying to God in that third heaven. Now you can take this passage and turn it into your own prayer to God. Here's a challenge. Get alone with God and, and just pray to God, uh, verse 6 and 7. God, you're the God who made the heavens. God, you're the Lord God who brought, uh, uh, chose Abraham and, and, and brought the children of Israel out of Egypt. Look, drop down to verse 17. Look at the end of verse 17. Thou art a God ready to pardon, gracious, merciful. God, you're a God who is slow to anger. You're a God of great kindness. And you do not forsake us. Verses 31 to 38, you can do the same. Make it your prayer to, the God, to God. It's a beautiful expression of praise and worship and confession. Now, beginning in verse 7, the Levites, the Jewish leaders, remember the history of Israel. They recount the history of how God has been good to them, how God has not forsaken them. I thought it would be good for us to do that today. What has God done for you? Has God done anything for you? I'd like you to take a moment, if you got a pen, and write down three things God has done for you. If you don't have a pen, just go through it in your mind. Right now, right now. Jot down. Maybe it's something big. Maybe it's something small. What has God done for you? Three things God has done for you. For me, God transformed my family when I was a teenager. I'll never forget it. I'll never stop thanking him for what he did for my family as a teenager. What has God done for you? For me, he, he carried me through the deepest trial of my life when my first wife lost our uh, third child in miscarriage and the same week we're told that she's got cancer 
and we walked through that valley, the shadow of death, and, and she passed away. He carried me uh, through that deep trial. He carried me as a single dad. He carried me when I was a single pastor. Uh, you, you know that footprints poem where there's two set of footprints, and then in the hard times, there's one set of footprints, and, and the author says, God, where were you? And, and the answer is, is, I carried you. I carried you in those hard times. And he carried me. I thank him for that. The lady who wrote that, Margaret Fishback Powers, she's from a little town in Canada called Tilsonburg, and that's where Jody is from. What has God done for you? What he's done for me? He's given me a beautiful, wonderful wife who loves God, five wonderful children, four tremendous grandchildren, and one more on the way, Lord willing, in October. What has he done for you? And because he has been so good to you, you want to you wanna be right with him. And how you get right with him is you confess your sins to God. You confess your sins to God. Why should we confess? Because of who he is and what he promises. He is a forgiving God. He is a God who promises pardon. We see that in verse 17. So what are the results of their confession? And we can experience these two. What are the results? Their fellowship with God is restored. We see that in verse 38. Chapter 9, verse 38. Because all, all this, we make a sure covenant and write it, and our princes, Levites and priests, seal unto it. Now those that sealed were Nehemiah, the Tershatha, that's the governor, the son of Hakaliah, and Zidkajah, and a whole bunch of other names. They actually sign their name, and they seal it, and say, we have restored our fellowship with God. They have not out his compassion. There is no one who is too far gone for God. His compassion is inexhaustible. Notice also, they restored their fellowship with God. They were united together and they were united together with their leaders. Chapter 10, verse 29. They clave to their brethren. They clave to their nobles. You don't have to like everyone in the family of God, but you are commanded to love them. You're commanded to love them. Have you discovered yet that Scott Wendell is not a perfect pastor? Have you discovered that our social pastors are not perfect pastors? If you're not sure, if you thought we walked on water, we don't, we sink, all right? You just stick around another week and you'll discover it. These people claim to their brethren, they claim to their nobles. You have to know, understand this book of Nehemiah. In chapter 5, they're mad at the nobles. They're mad at the leaders because these leaders were charging interest. These leaders were buying their sons and their daughters as bond slaves to be servants. They got mad at them. But now they have forgiven them. They've forgiven their sins. They have forgiven their mistakes. And they are united together. And that's what forgiven people do. We forgive others. No grudges, no resentment, no bitterness. What a great way to live. Whether it be your family member, your friend, your leader, your coworker, your boss, your employee, we forgive. We forgive. They united together and with their leaders. We need to do this. You know, some people, some people in our own church, I mean, they see things in black and white. Everything is black and white. That's how you see things. And then, and then there's another group of people in our church. They don't see that way at all. They see it all in color. They're very spontaneous. They, when they were in kindergarten, there were no lines. It's just, oh, let me just doodle over here. And, and uh, uh, they don't understand those people. Those people don't understand them. But you know what God said? God said in the church, it, you, you, it's like a body. And a body has different parts. And the, every part of the body needs the other parts in the body and so if you're one of those and you see things in black and white you need to take a breath and take a step back and listen and learn from those people over there and if you are these people over there and you see those people you need to take your breath and take a step back and listen and learn from those too you say, Pastor, where are you in this mix? I tell you, I am right here in the perfect spot in the middle. I see things 
just perfectly, all right? <laughs> and that's where you think you are, too. <laughs> you think how you see things is exactly the way it's supposed to be. But guess what? We're all wrong. And so we need one another. We need to listen to one another to bring some balance into our lives. And so these people are just like us, but they were united together in a mission, in a cause. And the church were united together under Jesus Christ, his glory, his great commission. Notice also the results of confession is they commit to follow God's law. Chapter 10, verse 29. They claimed to their brethren, the nobles, they entered into a curse, into an oath, to walk in God's law, which was given by Moses, the servant of God, to observe, to do all the commandments of the Lord, of the Lord our Lord, and his judgments and his statutes. Not only do we need to be in God's word to know what we are supposed to do to please God, but we need to be in it daily to remind us to do what we know is right. You know, some of you have been saved 50 years, and some of you might have been saved uh, five years, and maybe some of you have been saved only five weeks. But the Bible says we all need the word of God daily. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Some of the older Christians think, oh, well, that's for those new Christians. That's not what it says. It says that all Christians need to desire God's word the way a newborn desires to be fed. If you need an illustration, volunteer for the nursery, infant nursery, okay? When that baby wants to be fed, he or she's going to let you know in a very dramatic fashion as if they're dying. They're not dying. They're just hungry. And may that be the kind of hunger that we have for God's word. If you've been saved five months, five years, or 50 years, they commit to follow God's law. Notice they tithe. Even the Levites tithe, chapter 10, verse 38. So the people gave a tithe, brought it to the house of God. But then those people, they tithe on the tithe. And then there's the vow to worship in God's house. Look at the end of chapter 10, verse 39. We will not forsake the house of our God. I love that. We will not forsake the house of our God. A commitment to worship together in God's house. Hey, hey, this message of confession can be a hard one, especially if it has been a while since you have done this. Confession, I'm telling you, it's good for your soul, but it's also good for your body. It's good for your heart. It's good for your mind. It's good for your family. It's good for your relationships and your friendships. And we do it privately. We do not have a confessional booth or confessional office in this church. And as long as I breathe, there will never be a confessional booth in this church. Because that confessional booth is here in your heart. You go to God directly. 1 Timothy 2, 5, there is one God, one mediator between God and man, and that is who? The man, Christ Jesus. It's as if when Jesus died on this cross, with one hand, he reaches out to God the Father, and with the other hand, he reaches down to, to you and I. And so in Christ, we meet God. In your notes, if you are ready to receive Christ as your Savior, you come directly to Jesus Christ. In the same way as a Christian, we come directly to the Lord Jesus for forgiveness. Confession, it's a great way to live. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the power of it. I thank you for the example of these, these believers. Now, God, help us to keep short accounts with you. Help us to walk close with you. When we fall, when we trip, when we stumble, may we get up and come back to you in seeking forgiveness through confession. Heads about, eyes are closed. You say, Pastor, if I die today, I know I'd go to heaven. I have the confidence that once I confess Jesus as Lord, I remember that I trusted Christ and I am born again, and I'm not ashamed 
to let others know that I'm a true Christian. Would you simply raise your hand all over this congregation? I've been saved. I'm born again. You may put your hands down. Say, Pastor, I, I think I'm saved. I hope I'm saved, but I have doubt. I'm not sure. I'm not sure that heaven's my home. But I believe the Bible, and I believe Jesus died for me, and I, I want to be saved today. I want to be saved today. I'll lead you in that salvation prayer. You can confess the Lord from your heart and be born again. If that's you, would you simply raise your hand? Pastor, I'm not sure that I'm saved, but I want to be saved today. Would you lift it up? Hold it up high for just a moment that I might be able to see it. Anyone at all, I want to be saved. I want to trust Christ as my Savior. Thank you. You can put your hand down. Would you pray with me right now where you're seated? You can ask the Lord into your heart. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You can pray from your heart. You can pray silently. God will hear the prayer from your heart, but it must be genuine and sincere. Pray with me now. Dear Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sin. I believe Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that he died for me and rose again. Please come into my heart and become my Lord and Savior. I turn from my sin to you. Please save me today. Now, if you just pray with me, I want to say welcome to the family of God. You can experience this assurance that heaven is your home and Christ is your Savior. Christian, our heads are bowed as we come into God's presence. When was the last time you took time to confess your sin, to name it? Just you and God, you and God. So easy to say, Lord, I confess my sin. It's much harder and more biblical to say, Lord, I confess the sin of my pride. I confess my anger and my lust. I confess the sin of my unkind words. I confess my stubborn and hard heart. I confess my judgmental and critical spirit. I confess my cursing. I confess my taking your name in vain as sin. Oh God, I confess my laziness. I haven't picked up your Bible, my Bible in days. I've ignored you. I haven't talked to you. I haven't read your word. Would you confess it now to the Lord? You and God. Whatever it may be, you fill in the blank. Maybe you need to confess to your spouse, to your kids, to your parents, to your friends. This is for all of us. We all need forgiveness. We all need cleansing. My righteousness, oh God, how I need you. Lord, we pause in your presence. We need you. We, we've talked about you. We've talked about your word. We've talked about how, how you worked in these people's lives. They are an example to us. They read and heard your word. They confessed their sin. They worshiped. They were filled with great joy and peace. And this is our desire, to walk close with our God. Now, Father, I pray with all the differences in our congregation that we will come together united in what you have for us to fulfill your great commission, to give you glory, to uplift and exalt Jesus Christ. But God, help us to stay close to your heart. When we fumble and fail, and we do, God, teach us to be quick to come back to you. I pray in Jesus' name, amen, amen.